Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, making a throwing knife using very simple tools that can be found in any average guy's shop. So when I was a kid, I saved my allowance for six months to buy up a knife and then I took the knife into the backyard and threw it into the same tree over and over until I killed it. So I guess you could say I've got throwing knives in my blood. We're going to be using the kind of tools that can be found in a lot of folks shops, uh, primarily a bench grinder and an angle grinder. For this project, we'll be using a steel called 5160. 5160 is a sort of medium to high carbon steel with a pinch of chromium. It doesn't hold an edge especially well, but it's quite shock resistant and it's relatively easy to heat treat, making it ideal for a homemade throwing knife. I bought this from Admiral Steel probably about 15 years ago. I've designed this knife in Fusion 360, a CAD CAM program that we'll need for the third video in this series. I've printed up a one-to-one -one scale version of the knife so I can cut out the pattern and then lay it out on the steel. Once I've cut the bar with a cutoff wheel on my angle grinder, I'll begin by laying out the design on the steel blank. Before going any further, I'll drill two holes in the tang. Now, we're not putting a handle on this knife, so why the holes? Well, because we're doing three more or less identical knives in three videos. We'll need those holes for the technique we'll be using in another video, but not in this one. So if you want to skip that step, hey, feel free. Or you can drill one of them so you'll have a hole to hang on the wall. Up to you. Just a note about hole drilling. When I'm making knives, the first thing I always do is drill the holes. Clamping up a rectangular bar in a drilling vise is really easy. An irregularly shaped knife, not so much. Now it's time to grind the outer profile of the knife. I'll use an angle grinder for that task. Normally I'd use a belt grinder, but an angle grinder still makes pretty short work of it. I'm using two main tools in this video, an angle grinder and a bench grinder. If you don't have an angle grinder, but you do have a bench grinder, you can do the profiling there. Once we've got the overall shape of the blade squared away, we'll turn to grinding the bevels on the bench grinder. This is by far the biggest challenge of this entire project. Because we're using a wheel, the bevels we'll grind will be radius. In other words, we're doing hollow grinds. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Hollow grinding has a number of challenges. I'm going to show a couple things that might help you get everything to come out even but none of it's foolproof. Just be aware that even though you're using pretty simple tools here, the techniques are reasonably advanced. Now, there are two basic ways of grinding, whether you're doing it on a belt grinder or a stone or whatever. One is freehand grinding, where you simply use your hands to support the knife. The other method uses gizmos called jigs to support the work, making for easier, faster, more accurate grinds. Now, Jigs used for flat grinding, like I would do on my belt grinder, can really be just bone simple. But for hollow grinding, sorry to say, most jigs are typically quite complex. So for this video, I'm going to stick with some, let's call them grinding aids. Calling them jigs is probably giving them a little more credit than they deserve. I'll start by clamping a little piece of wood on the tool rest of my bench grinder. 
By resting the base of the knife against the wood, I'm able to maintain a fairly consistent angle of blade to wheel. This is important because if the angle changes, the grind will wobble and look terrible. I'm using the coarse 60 grit stone for efficient removal. Now this isn't going to be as fast as a professional belt grinder, but honestly I was pretty surprised. It's not too bad. Now the key point in grinding any bevels, and this is true whether you're grinding hollow grinds or flat grinds, is that whatever angle that you set the knife to the grinding surface, that's the angle that your bevel's going to come out. And you want to keep grinding that angle pretty consistently the whole time. Each bevel needs to be at exactly the same angle so that they'll all come out symmetrical. If you grind at too shallow an angle, you'll end up just cutting a little gully through the middle of the blade and it won't actually sharpen the edge. So here's the process that I'll follow. I'll grind a few sweeps on one bevel, then flip the blade over top to bottom and do the opposite bevel on side two. Then I'll flip the blade from side to side and work the other two bevels in the same manner using a reverse grip. Keep a count of how many strokes you're making so that your bevels develop evenly and try to do them with the same kind of pressure on each side. If you haven't done this before, word of warning, it'll be harder to do with your weak hand side. That's just part of the game and you have to work a little harder and maybe go just a little bit slower on that side to maintain an even grind. I'll continue going back and forth, working all four bevels back toward the spine. If you do everything right and keep them even, you'll automatically develop a nice straight center line. Another important point is that you want to keep the edge perpendicular to the rotation of the wheel. In other words, you want to keep that edge basically parallel with the floor which means that you're sort of rocking the blade downward as you approach the tip. This way your grind will be even all the way down to the tip. Easier said than done. Good thing this is just a throwing knife. A few wobbles won't hurt performance at all. Now the problem with this little grinding aid that I've made is that as you grind the bevels, the angle changes slightly and it's harder to maintain a consistent angle at the tip. Once you've gotten the bevels ground 80 or 90 percent of the way, you may want to shift strategies. So, here's another approach. I'll take this little Teflon rod, drill a hole, and then tap it for a quarter 20 thread. Then I'll use this little hole in the tang to screw it onto the rod. See, there was a use for that hole after all. Now I'll anchor the rod against my chest and sweep the blade back and forth against the grinder. By anchoring it each time in exactly the same place, I'm able to maintain a consistent grinding angle. I don't know, I'm not sold on this approach, but if you're having trouble with the first method, try it and see if it works for you. Now one last point, like I said earlier, the steeper the angle that you hold the blade with respect to the wheel, the steeper the bevel you form. In this case, I'm going to run my bevel all the way to the center line of the knife. That's kind of a fancy way of doing it, but for a throwing knife, there's really no need to bring that center line all the way back. It's much less technically demanding to make, say, a quarter inch or three eighths inch bevel and not go all the way to the center line. The knife will still stick into a piece of wood okay if you do it that way. So if you get started and feel unconfident that you'll be able to run your bevels back as far as I do, just steepen up that angle and run a narrow bevel and you'll still end up with a useful knife. After I got the bevels pretty well established, I finished up by grinding freehand. Now I've been grinding knife bevels for almost 20 years, so I have a little bit of a jump on this thing. That said, I don't do a ton of hollow grinding myself, and certainly not on a bench grinder. So this was a bit of an education for me too. Nevertheless, short of making a complex jig, freehand technique seemed to give me the best results as I got close to my final grind lines. 
So the key to freehand hollow grinding is to very gently feather the blade in from the edge until you feel it seating in the hollow that you've already ground. Once you feel it seating smoothly in the hollow with no chatter, you start moving it out toward the tip. If you see wiggles and wobbles forming, you're not getting it seated in that same hollow every time, and so you're grinding sort of separate tracks or hollows on each pass. Now that the bevels are done, I'll break the edges on the tang to make the blade easier to handle. We're really not going for cosmetics here. I just don't want to cut myself on a sharp edge when throwing the knife. And here's the final result. I'll be cleaning it up a little after heat treat, so that's close enough for rock and roll. Speaking of heat treating, if you've never made a knife before, Heat treating is the process of converting steel to its hardest form so it'll hold an edge. Now not all steels can be hardened. As I said earlier, we're using 5160 steel here, but there are many, many kinds of steel that will work. If you're in any doubt about what kind of steels can or can't be hardened, I'll add a link here to a video that I did about what kinds of steel can be used for knife making. Just a quick hint, going to Home Depot and buying welding steel will not do it. Anyway, moving on. We'll be aiming to bring this blade to about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit or 800-ish Celsius. Any heat source capable of generating that kind of heat will work. I'll be using an oxypropane torch, but you can even do this with charcoal if you want. I'll include a link here to a video where I use charcoal for heat treating. Lots of different things will work. You can buy weed burner type propane tips for 20 bucks at Harbor Freight that should get you there too. Incidentally, the last time I did a video using this method of heat treating, I got comments from innumerable yahoos who claimed I was using an acetylene torch. Dear yahoos, no, it's oxypropane. There is such a thing. Oxypropane is nice for knife makers because it doesn't burn as hot as acetylene, and it doesn't smoke and get soot all over parts that you're brazing, soldering, and things of that nature. Also, it's one less tank of gas I have to worry about running out in the middle of a project. You'll notice that as I heat the blade, I have this little magnet on a stick in my left hand. When steel reaches about 1425 Fahrenheit, it stops attracting magnets. So, once the magnet stops sticking to the steel, I know that I'm close to my target temperature. I'm playing my flame mostly at the base of the blade. The tip will overheat if given a chance, and overheating steel causes rapid growth of the grain size of the steel, which in turn leads to brittleness. The more evenly I can heat the whole thing, the better knife I'll make. So I start at the bottom and work my way up. Now normally this is a process I do in semi-darkness so that I can see the color of the steel with maximum clarity. Obviously for photographic purposes I can't do that. But the point I'm making is that it's commonly said you should heat steel to cherry red and then quench it. But the color of steel depends entirely on the level of ambient light. So. The temperature that looks cherry red in semi-darkness looks almost black outside in direct sunlight. The magnet, however, knows 1425, whether it's noon in July or whether you're inside a cave. Once I've judged the temperature to be about right, I'll plunge the blade into warm peanut oil. Not the tang, just the blade itself. Once most of the color has left the tang, I'll immerse that. The tang will stay soft and the blade will be hard. When the blade's cool enough to touch, I pull it out and scrape it with the corner of a file. The file should skate across the surface of the hardened steel, whereas it kind of bites into the softer steel of the tang. If it doesn't feel this way, then it hasn't hardened, so you'll need to repeat the process again. People often ask me if there's a problem with rehardening steel. There's not. You can't do it infinitely, but a couple or three times won't hurt. Next, I'll temper the blade, meaning that I'll reduce the hardness of the steel. In this case, I'm heating it to 600 Fahrenheit in my heat treating oven. This will make it extremely shock resistant, though not very hard. Perfect for a throwing knife. Now, if you don't have an oven that you can take to 600 degrees, you can go 475 in a kitchen oven and you'll be just fine. Bear in mind, there's just slightly more likelihood of the tip cracking off somewhere along the way. After an hour at temperature, I'll give the bevels a finished grind. 
if you want it to be pretty, you can sand the whole thing and buff it and do whatever you want to it. But for me, that's pretty much wasted on a throwing knife. So I'll leave it right here. All right, let's test it out. I'll see how many times in a row I can stick it in this piece of shipping crate. And we're done. So this video is part of a three-part series. Uh, I'm going to be making the, basically the exact same knife three different ways. We started out with real simple tools. Next, I'm going to use kind of conventional knife maker's tools a belt grinder and some other uh, you know drill press and some other things like that uh, and then finally we're going to do a third one where we're going to use a CNC machine and all of them are going to end up looking more or less the same basically the same level of quality and all that but the methods that we use to get there totally different <laughs> Thanks for watching guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon.